today's edition of the University of Texas Energy Symposium. Uh, next week's speaker will be Adam Warren. He's the director of Integrated Applications Center at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and he's going to give a talk called Hawaii, uh, Postcard from the Future. So the future of the electricity system or the energy system seen through the lens of Hawaii and the changes that are going on there. So uh, tune in next week for that one. Today we have Justin Ritchie. Uh, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia at the uh, Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. He's going to talk to us about uh, sort of the scenarios or the ways in which uh, future uh, economic scenarios are developed within the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sort of process. Uh, and so the talk will review this critical understanding of questions for the energy technology pathways that are used to frame and assess decisions that are consistent with uh, global uh, climate policy goals. And to do so, he's going to talk about the energy scenarios presented in the IPC assessment and tell us some details about the assumptions that are made and how this affects the answers and how we should really be thinking about uh, interpreting the results from these analyses. So uh, thank you for coming. Justin, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Kerry. It's great to see all of you here. And Thanks. Thanks for the applause. <laughs> it's, I, I always feel awkward because I never know to applaud at the start or the end or anything like that. So, um, but yeah, it's great to come in from Vancouver and talk about revisiting business as usual, why our worst case climate scenarios aren't as bad as we thought, and two degrees is more readily achievable. And so just a quick summary of everything. Uh, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion, they present a serious challenge as they accumulate in the atmosphere. Um, however, what I'm going to argue is that the scientific community has been and is examining the climate change problem through a lens that's disconnected from global energy supply and demand realities. And then this disconnect also feeds back into our understanding of efforts to reduce CO2 emissions and how uh, much these reductions will cost and uh, questions such as will getting to two degrees be extremely difficult. And also, Kerry said that sometimes it's uh, common for you to ask questions in the middle. So if anything's unclear or, uh, or you need clarification, uh, just go ahead and ask, and we'll see how that's going. And then if we run out of time, I'll have to hold the additional questions to the end. But um, back to the talk, I'll just assume we all agree on that point, that climate change is, is a serious challenge. And so we won't really even talk about that today. We're just going to focus on, on these two points. So I think it's interesting having been working on this for so many years, and now just in the last week or so, David Wallace Wells, who writes a lot for the New York Times and uh, for other publications, he just put out a new book about imagining worst case climate scenarios, and it's getting a lot of press, and it's uh, getting around, and he just had this opinion piece in the New York Times about is it time to panic? And that uh, the age of panic is here and that we really need to be fearing the worst case scenario and using fear as the prime motivator for action. And so is it time to panic about climate change and embrace fear? Well, you'll have a more uh, multidimensional perspective on that at the end of the talk. So overall, we're going to talk about how business as usual climate scenarios are used in science and policy and what do they mean, how these business as usual scenarios depict technology for energy supply and demand, and how we should revise our understanding of these scenarios and whether that changes our thinking on climate change. Okay, so as an example of how business as usual scenarios are used in economic and policy studies, uh, this paper from 2017 on estimating economic damage from climate change in the United States and science from a lot of leading climate economists in the US. Um, I'll just zero in on this one piece of the abstract where by the late 21st century, the poorest third of U.S. counties are projected to experience damages between 2 and 20 percent of county income under business as usual emissions. And what this study does is they run different scenarios and look at impacts in uh, uh, economic impacts specifically on a county by county level across the United States. And what you want to take away from this description of business as usual is this representative concentration pathway 8.5 to 8.5 scenario is the business as usual scenario in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fifth Assessment Report. And that's what we're going to talk about in more detail today. Here's another example that's a little bit closer to home of business as usual and how it's used. This article in the Los Angeles Times about a study that reports that the Hurricane Harvey uh, type rainfall uh, probability of it could rise to nearly one in five per year by 
the year 2100. And this uh, article was reporting on a study in PNAS on uh, assessing the present and future probability of Hurricane Harvey's rainfall by Kerry Emanuel. He's a climate atmospheric scientist. He does a really great job. I use his book on what we know about climate change in my uh, sustainability class at UBC. Um, but zeroing in on the abstract, what we see is that this whole study is based on the IPCC fifth assessment uh, 8.5 scenario of future climate change. And that what he's doing in the study is he's essentially just drawing a line between now and the end of the century using the 8.5 scenario and then extrapolating backwards in order to calculate the odds of these types of events. So use of whichever scenario he chooses means that the results, and this is the case in many climate studies, are entirely dependent on the scenario that's chosen. So it's important to understand what goes into this 8.5 scenario. So last year, my co-author and I, we released a paper challenging some of the assumptions that went into the high warming scenarios and uh, similar scenarios. And Eric Rossner at Bloomberg, he was covering it. And he just did a search when he was writing his piece on how much different uh, scenarios are actually used in the scientific literature. And so this isn't by far the most rigorous scientific study on this kind of thing. He just went to Google Scholar and typed it in and counted the results. And so he found that the high warming RCP 8.5 scenario was the most widely used of all the scenarios, although the lower medium warming scenario 4.5 fell a little bit below that. So, what does the 8.5 scenario mean? That's what we're going to talk about next. And in order to do that, we just have to recap the greenhouse effect, which is, as I see it from a physics perspective, is really an energy balance question. Because we have solar radiation that's traveling through the vacuum of space. It's coming uh, into the atmosphere. Some of it's uh, reflected. But then some of it, about half, is absorbed by the Earth's surface. And then it warms the Earth's surface, which causes it to emit infrared radiation. And this is what's trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so the key way that we measure that influence of greenhouse gases, of carbon dioxide, of methane, and other GHGs is with radiative forcing, which the official definition of that is that radiative forcing is a measure of the influence a factor has in altering the balance of incoming and outgoing energy in the Earth atmosphere system. So, when we're looking at future climate scenarios that are used by climate modelers and Earth system modelers uh, to examine climate impacts, that's what they're modeling, are sets of greenhouse gases and how they project out in the future and change radiative forcing and changing the energy balance of the planet that leads to more warming and climate impacts. So when we look over the 21st century all the way out to 2100, uh, the 8.5 scenario, it's called RCP 8.5 because it's a scenario that leads to, and let me see if I can get my laser to work here, kind of working. I kind of see it. There we go. All right. So it's leading to about 8.5 watts per meter squared of radiative forcing. And the lower scenarios are leading to lower levels of radiative forcing. We're around 2.8 watts per meter squared today. And so what it's showing is a world where changes in the energy system, changes in population, changes in the economy lead to this level of uh, climate change. So it was designed as the IPCC fifth assessment business as usual scenario, meaning no climate policy. And the lower scenarios, the RCP 6 and 4.5, were designed as moderate policy scenarios and the 2.6 as a strong climate policy scenario. So now that we have all that jargon out of the way of radio forcing scenarios, we can talk about how they're used. So when you look at the IPCC uh, assessment, and this is something I do with my students in the classes, I have them look over the summary for policymakers document. And uh, what you see are a lot of plots like this, where you see the different scenarios, and they're run in intercomparison projects of climate models that are looking at how this energy flows in the Earth system and impacts, and Earth system models, which might have uh, biological factors, say, in the oceans and so on, and creating these uncertainty ranges for a different scenario based on all the different models that are run with different sets of parameters. And so they will all run the same scenarios in order to have a common basis for comparison. And so this is what it looks like for sea level rise, and then you'll get plots like this that summarize the outputs for global surface temperature change. And even though this is interesting from an earth science basis, for us as energy professionals, as energy students, this is somewhat abstract because ultimately this is just a level of radiative forcing that comes from greenhouse gases. It's not 
necessarily explicitly linked when climate modelers use it back to a set of energy assumptions and global economic assumptions and population assumptions and so on. So um, the uh, energy and climate policy community has a suite of several dozen energy economy integrated assessment models and they create data that supports the use of these RCP scenarios and uh, analyses like these, which this one was published in uh, Nature, which is showing uh, current greenhouse gases uh, by this white line and then uh, different outcomes from no climate policies and current climate policies and then Paris Agreement pledges and then two degree pathways and 1.5 degree pathways. And this is, mirrors much of the conversation in the media and the press. And then here's a more technical way of looking at it. So this particular image is from a 2016 paper by Regeli et al. And they were looking at uh, the no policy baselines and then how steps that are uh, different policies are implemented to subtract from that down to the uh, Paris Agreement commitments and so on down to two degrees, arguing that we have a long way to go from two degrees and so we need an additional policies uh, in order to bridge that gap, which I would agree with. But the RCP 8.5 scenario and scenarios like it produced by these energy economy models, they're up in this range and actually the RCP 8.5 scenario, if you look at the data underlying this plot, it's included in there. Um, why would we want to focus on them when what we really want to do is get to 2 or, or 1.5 degrees or, or lower levels of warming? Well, it's because they set the economic backdrop for all the policy assessments that aim for lower levels of warming, such as 2 or 1.5 when these models are run and when they're used. So climate scenarios, uh, actually it's, it's interesting when I was doing my PhD, one of the great things you get to do when you do a PhD is you get to go back and have the ability to read all of the IPCC assessments in detail and see how they've changed over time. It's probably not something you can do once you're a, a full professor by any means, or maybe you can, I don't know. But when, when you go back and you look at all of the, the IPCC assessments, you see business as usual warming leading to four to five degrees above pre-industrial. And that's basically what the projection is showing now. Sometimes the axes are changed a little bit where they have different baselines that look at the late 20th century in order, uh, other than pre-industrial, but it's still about four to five uh, degrees above pre-industrial. But curiously enough, um, when uh, we look at the energy scenarios to actually uh, produce these biz business as usual outcomes, these policy baselines, those also haven't changed very much over the years. And so that's what we're going to talk about next is how business as usual scenarios depict technology for energy supply and demand. So. When we look at total primary energy supply globally, I think a lot of you are familiar with what this looks like in terms of growing oil and natural gas and coal and nuclear power and hydro renewables. And uh, since the mid 20th century, they've, they've been growing uh, rapidly and this is all data from the VP statistical review. And so when we're thinking about greenhouse gas emission scenarios and especially carbon dioxide from the energy system, we have to think how this is going to change and going to evolve in the next 80 or so years. Well, in order to anchor ourselves, we can just look at the proportion of each of these fuel sources, each of these resources in the global energy mix, and it's about one third uh, oil, about a quarter natural gas, a little over a quarter coal, about 5% nuclear, and about 10% hydro and renewables. So that's a starting point from where we're at now. What would it take to actually reach RCP 8.5, to actually get to that level? Well, we need to expand the vertical axis quite a bit and then fill in the gap, and there we go. So that's RCP 8.5, which is showing a future of very rapid growth in primary energy supply, much faster than what we've had since the mid-20th century, uh, growth of three times from today's level. And then the most important thing to note that we're going to focus on for the rest of this talk is how coal becomes the dominant energy form. It's actually depicting a transition to a coal-based energy system. And you'll also want to note that uh, both oil and gas decline significantly after growing quite a bit in the near term. So if we compare the RCP 8.5 kind of world that was in the original publications of RCP 8.5 as describing what it would take to get to that scenario, uh, we see uh, most uh, specifically that we have a transition to a coal-based energy system. Well, why would this happen? Uh, why does this occur? 
And when you look into it, actually a cold dominated future is the same one reflected here in all of the models that are used, integrated assessment models that produce these no climate policy worlds. And that was one of the surprising things to me when I thought, well, maybe RCP 8.5, it's just an exception. It's the only one. And, and uh, maybe these other integrated assessment models are, are showing less. But actually, RCP 8.5 compared to some of them is quite conservative on the amount of coal that it uses. And we'll get to that in a minute. So where does this come from? Well, it's because back through the history of IPCC assessments, since the first IPCC assessment, climate science and policy has been using a hypothesis that the global energy system transitions to one dominated by coal because we must rely on coal to meet growing energy demand in the face of more limited oil and gas. And that's the concept. And uh, coal has not been the dominant energy source since the 1950s, so an assumption like that requires strong justification. And the justification is that there's a virtually limitless supply of coal. Coal can be extracted at a lower cost than any alternative. All else held equal. Coal is the backstop energy supply if all other technologies fail us. And that coal recovery technologies can achieve unforeseen and unanticipated drastic specific technology improvement rates several times the historically observed average if we need it. And this concept goes back to the energy economy models that were developed in the wake of the oil crisis of the 1970s. And many of those model developers uh, that were tackling this energy challenge of the 1973-1979 oil crises were the same people who began to tackle the climate challenge. And so many of these assumptions were actually, actually adopted by the energy economy models that became integrated assessment models to look at the climate, ch uh, climate challenge. And so when you go back to the mindset at the time, now I wasn't alive, maybe some of you in this room can remember it, but uh, when I read about uh, how much of a psychological shock that was to have uh, a, an extended period after World War II of uh, growing oil production um, and uh, growing uh, motoring and, and driving and personal car transport diffusion, and then to run into this uh, point where there's rationing and plates are filled on alternate days and so on, it was a huge uh, collective shock in, in uh, the United States and in Western Europe. And so a range of different energy studies and models were commissioned by governments to look at how to solve the energy problem. And uh, the Canadian energy scholar, uh, Vaskov Smil, he writes in Energy at the Crossroads, Global Perspectives and Uncertainties. He recaps some of the studies that were released at that time. And so here's one, the workshop on alternative energy strategies at MIT. Um, he wrote about, uh, he, he recaps how the study found that oil exhaustion curves generated by the project show global output peaking as early as 1990 and no later than the year 2004, with the most likely timing of peak production between 1994 and 1997. The US CIA put out a, a study that uh, said the global oil output must fall within a decade ahead. As a result, the world can no longer count on an increase in oil production to meet its energy needs and it does not have years in which to make a smooth transition to alternative energy sources. And so these reflect the kinds of concepts that were put into the energy models that were used. And so the International uh, Institute for Applied Systems Analysis uh, in Austria, they were commissioned to do a multi-year uh, modeling study of global energy and how it's going to develop. And so uh, they developed the Energy in a Finite World study that produced scenarios a high and a low scenario out to 2030 to look at the global energy mix and how it's going to change. And so I think it's interesting to look back at that because it really uh, it gives you humility as a modeler when you face unknowns and uh, how to model uncertainty. Because what you see is actually, uh, I must commend the modelers to get so close when, when you look at around uh, 2020, where we're at today, and the total amount of liquids production. Uh, they were quite close. They were really spot on. But what uh, is different is the mix of, uh, of oil uh, types of liquids that we'd be using globally, where conventional just doesn't grow at all from the 1970s, and unconventionals kick in in the mid-1980s, uh, which you know they got to some extent, right? We're using uh, more unconventional sources now. But then even those can't meet growing demand. And so coal to liquid technology has to kick in as the coal backstop that I was talking about earlier. And it continues growing uh, quite rapidly, actually, now when you look at models uh, put out by message, uh, scenarios put out by the message model. So uh, now we have the ability to do a retrospective, to look back at how this model uh, stacks up. They produced a high and a low scenario in the study. 
And uh, unfortunately, my laser pointer, I can't really see it very well, so I don't know if you can see it all that well. But you produced a high and a low scenario, and for primary energy, how do we stack up? Well, we've tracked uh, quite close to the low scenario, the one that was described as, as very pessimistic and negative. So I thought that was interesting. Amory Lovins actually wrote uh, an analysis of this message energy model, and he decried a lot of the language that was used around the low scenario about how it was pessimistic and negative. He was saying at that time that, well, what if it's actually an optimistic scenario? What if we don't need to use as many uh, primary energy resources, right? But it all depends on your perspective. And so this message energy model, it overestimated primary energy supply and demand. When we look at coal, uh, the high and the low scenario uh, projections for coal, well, we actually tracked well below the, even the low scenario for coal. Uh, up until just recently, it took China's unprecedented expansion in coal just to even get close to the low scenario. And so then how did it end up on oil? Well, uh, judging from the slide uh, a few slides ago, uh, you can possibly guess how that looks. And we actually ended up tracking the low scenario for quite a bit, but have now uh, pulled away from it and underestimated oil supply and demand using this modeling approach. So what do total primary energy supply scenarios from the message model look like 40 years later? Well, we're back to RCP 8.5, which used the message model in order to generate this scenario. And so that takes us to the question of why do RCP 8.5 and other business as usual climate scenarios anticipate future coal dominance in these modeling frameworks? Well, so what we have to do when we're thinking about the long term and producing a model is we have to think about technologies that could emerge in the future that could produce resources that uh, exist that aren't accessible today. And so we have to look at a uh, total amount of resource base and then thinking about which of these could be economic to produce in the future. And so that's where the distinction between reserves and resources come from, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. We have these dimensions of degrees of e geologic certainty and of the feasibility of economic recovery. And then when we add all the pieces together, we had a classic McKelvey diagram of reserves and resources. And we have different categories of proved and probable and possible and hypothetical and speculative. But when you're speculating about future scenarios, you have to think about which of these resource categories could have technologies that could produce them 30 or 40 years out, right? So what it means is that the way we think about this process of how resources become reserves or reserves become resources actually are the deciding factor in these long-run uh, resource scenarios like those produced by the message and other integrated assessment models. So one of the key ideas that determines how these models use resources in their scenarios is they're taking the reserves, which are the fraction of geologic uh, resources that are economically recoverable, and they're built on the assumption that all known geological occurrences of energy resources eventually can become reserves, maintaining what's called an equilibrium reserves to production <laughs> ratio. And so uh, just to get a little bit more concrete about what this reserves to production ratio means, it's uh, if we take the amount of reserves that are uh, economic to produce and we divide that by the total amount of oil production in the year 2017, we have about 1,250 billion barrels of oil in reserves and 34 billion barrels of oil produced last year, we get 37. So roughly 37 years of today's technology for producing conventional oil. Well, when you're doing a modeling study like this, you add all the total resources into that as well. And so you get a total reserves and resources amount. And you divide that by current production, you get something like 70, 73 in this case. And so the modeling studies that are informing integrated assessment models that are used for the IPCC policy database, they look at the total amount of resources. And in this case, I pulled out from the study that did that oil, conventional oil, conventional gas, and coal. And they're looking at this total resource number. And what you'll notice is that for coal, we're talking about uh, an amount of coal that's in the Earth's crust on the order of millennia as compared to a century or less for oil and gas. And so this is where the coal backstop idea that we were talking about before that was uh, used in the wake of the 1970s energy crises it enters into the models that we use today. It's that 
there's 38 times more coal than oil, there's 24 times more coal than gas, and so if we run out of oil and gas, we can just use coal to replace the ways we use them, which is why coal ends up dominating in these long-run scenarios. So even an eight-fold expansion when you're talking about that much coal, uh, it looks very conservative. But the question my co-author and I asked is, is recoverable coal really that much more abundant than oil and gas? And so we can look at this equilibrium reserves to production ratio, which is based on the idea that as we use oil, there's an incentive to invest in exploration, to uh, explore for more, and uh, eventually develop that into production. And so when we look at the reserves to production ratio for oil uh, in the 1970s during the energy crises, and then into the 1980s, it was around 25. And then it's increased, this is using BP data, uh, it's increased and, and maintained relative stability. So in this case, the equilibrium reserves to production ratio idea used in these uh, energy economic models has been sufficient so far to explain technical progress trend in oil. However, when we add coal to that picture and we go back to what the modelers at that time were looking at in terms of reserves to production ratio, the idea was, well, there's 1,000 years, 900 years of coal reserves to production, and I'll just also note that there's an access break there. Um, so any amount of coal that we would use in order to fuel transportation or other industrial processes, uh, it's there and it can be harnessed. So if we run out of oil, that's the direction we'll need to go. But since then, the coal reserve to production ratio has continued to decline, and part of that's because production has gone up so much, but it's also because we're not doing like we do in oil where we're adding more reserves. It's that the amount of uh, reserves is remaining relatively static. And so uh, basically what we've seen is that the technical progress trend for coal has been one in that direction for the reserves to production ratio. And so when energy economy, energy economy modelers are using this kind of trend that's happened in oil and applying that to coal, it's creating this artificial bias toward coal-dominated futures. So uh, as I was just saying, this reserves to production ratio, it's gone down because global hard coal production has doubled in just over 10 years. But another piece uh, to consider is that this reserves to production ratio is not just about uh, economics and technology, it's also about the quality of information. And so as production uh, has increased, it's actually meant that we've had to revisit old areas and old uh, uh, reserve data and improve it. So uh, what we also saw over the period of that uh, global hard coal production uh, bull run was also a subsequent increase in price. And so that's something that when you look into detail at the integrated assessment models and, and the scenarios that pr they produce with an RCP 8.5, I'm not going to get too much into price, but it's just something to note that basically coal stays very cheap uh, is part of the reason why it gets adopted so much. But what my co-author and I argue is there's a key distinction between legacy coal assessments from the 70s, 80s, and 90s and the modern assessments that we have today after coal production has reached uh, such higher levels. So uh, why is there a difference? Well, the higher prices in production, as I've just highlighted, so increased production has created an incentive for improved understanding of the world coal reserve base. So we revisited previously assessed regions and found that now there's a town or a river or a road that's built over the coal, and so we can't get to it and mine it profitably. There's modern uh, societal constraints. There's sulfur regulations. Uh, there's environmental and labor conditions that are also constraints. Another factor highlighted by uh, Gruber 2012 is that um, in many uh, coal producing regions there are incentives for systematic overestimates. And so the recoverable portion of listed coal reserves is commonly overestimated because of this failure to distinguish between physically available coal and the amount that can be profitably, legally, and socially produced uh, through the assessment process. So another factor is the assessment technology, and this was noted by the USGS in National Coal Assessment, that better technology for mapping and recording and accounting for coal uh, is better identifying uh, regions that were maybe assessed in the 70s or earlier, and so this has created an assessment process that's defined by ongoing subtraction. Another factor is actually production technology itself and the rate at which coal is produced, where high productivity long wall coal mining needs thick seams, so that rules out some other uh, uh, more shallow the seams that used to be counted as reserves. And then the best economics for coal are for surface mining in regions like the Powder River Basin. So um, 
Another factor, and this is another big one, which is that international coordination and standardization of definitions uh, has meant that formally counted coal as reserves, which didn't mean the same thing as reserves as we would classify them in the United States, uh, has become more harmonized. And so the economic transition uh, post-USSR uh, has played a big role in that. So I'll just uh, highlight this one study by Wang et al. 2013 about coal in China. China's coal reserves in 1993, about 1,000 gigatons. And in 2000, despite uh, about 14 gigatons of production, it's exactly the same. And it's because Chinese coal data are notoriously bad. And so these authors, uh, doing a detailed study, they write that before 1999, the Soviet and Chinese classification systems were similar with both countries using centrally planned economic systems. And as a result, the main purpose of exploration activities was to identify quantities of mineral resources available for the central government. And these systems are primarily based on geological and technological conditions with little attention being paid to economic factors. And this old framework made comparison with other countries using more market-oriented classification systems difficult. They also wrote that these differences illustrate the challenges faced in estimating the size of Chinese coal resources as the availability of data and subsequent interpretation appear to be dogged by erroneous assumptions and misunderstanding. And this is something you see throughout the literature when you look at Chinese coal data. And so that's why, in summary, it, between these legacy and modern coal assessments, why modern reserve assessments are a far more accurate reflection of 21st century coal technologies uh, at recoverable upper bound than the far higher estimates of the past. And the total resource estimates have no analytical meaning for policy and climate scenarios, such as 3,000 years of coal, unless we develop uh, underground coal gasification. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like to. And so today's reserve estimates very likely reflect a plausible upper bound for recoverable coal. This is an outlook that, supported by the IEA in the Coal Information Report uh, 2016, uh, the authors wrote that for most years where expansion of proven reserves has occurred, it has done so outside of a commodities boom cycle, so illustrating this inelasticity to price. So record prices are not driving reclassification between resources and reserves. And this is also in the 2016 World Energy Outlook. They wrote, geological conditions are worsening, new mines are deeper and further away from markets, and coal quality is deteriorating. All of these factors put modest upward pressure on costs that cannot be fully offset by productivity gains. So this is also supported by a study by Moore et al. 2015. And they do a detailed study of mines and production around the world and produce a low and best guess and high outlook for total coal production. And so we can contrast the numbers that they put together with this uh, cumulative coal supply curve. So on this horizontal axis, we have coal supply. And then we have the cost of extraction. And we have the German Natural Resource, Resource Ministry uh, reserves marked here. We have the more at all 2015 numbers. And then we expand that out, and we look at RCP 8.5 coal production, which is quite a bit higher than that. And I'll just have you note that how there's uh, essentially no change in price between those two numbers, uh, which is something that's useful to note. But in the message energy model that produces the RCP 8.5 and other climate policy scenarios, the recoverable upper bound, it, it, the actual total supply curve is about four to six times the recoverable upper bound as identified by Moore et al. 2015. And the study that my co-author and I did were roughly in that same range around the, the German Natural Resource Ministry, the BGR uh, reserves number. And so when this is your supply curve for total coal, RCP 8.5 looks fundamentally conservative. And so when you have an RCP 8.5 scenario that's designed to show all theoretically extractable occurrences from the literature, you get something like this out of it. And so uh, this transition to coal is also regularly shown in models other than message that underlie plots like these. So I looked at in a recent paper the IPCC fifth assessment database, all the no policy scenarios, and looked at the amount of coal that they used. And so this is the number that's that uh, more at all 2015 number. And we can look at two three, four, and five times that. And each of these dots represents all of those new policy scenarios and how much coal that they use. And actually, I'll just say that this dot right here is the RCP 8.5 <coughs> scenario. So you can see how it actually is conservative compared to many of these other scenarios that use quite a bit more coal. And so of the 30 integrated assessment models that contributed to the policy database, uh, you get an outlook that looks something like this, where only a very small amount are 
treating this uh, reasonable amount of coal use as an upper bound and staying within it. And actually, I'd argue it's important when you're thinking about long-term energy developments to model a little bit more coal, because what if we do use more coal than reserves? But using you know, two, three, four, five times hard coal is just not supported by today's geologic understanding. When you think about what that means in the context of population and energy use, we can take the RCP 8.5 scenario and contrast that to coal per capita use, so the amount of coal used globally per person over history. As you'd expect, in the late 19th century, there's been a scale up. And then uh, this was interesting to me when, when I plotted this, because actually it's been a relative stasis uh, up until just recently with China's uh, coal production expansion. But what would it take to actually get to an RCP 8.5 scenario? Well, it would take that. It would take about a six times increase in global coal use per person uh, to reach RCP 8.5. And then we can add on to that plot the full range of all the integrated assessment model and the policy scenarios. So um, now, in order to close out the talk, we're going to cover uh, what uh, addressing this means for modifying thinking on climate change. So I think it's completely reasonable to look at resource assessments and use that to frame scenarios and let uh, expert judgment uh, on reserves and resources be a part of that. Everyone's going to have uh, different, who are experts in this field, they're going to have different opinions on how recoverable reserves and resources are. But when we take the German Natural Resource Ministry, this is their latest report, they do a very rigorous and, and good job of listing out reserves and resources around the world. And so when we add all the pieces together of unconventional oil and gas, conventional oil and gas, reserves and resources, and coal, that gives us our theoretical maximum, which it actually does come out fairly close to RCP 8.5. It's well above the lower scenarios. But I think uh, my uh, expert judgment says that recovering that amount of energy resources is uh, an extreme scenario. It's at the highest possible end of what you could expect. And it doesn't represent what I would call a no policy baseline. So if we stack all those different scenarios up uh, in parallel and compare them to the RCP scenarios, uh, I would argue that technological improvements are going to harness far more than today's reserves and discover more resources. So these scenarios here on the lower end of just using you know, all conventional oil and gas reserves and all conventional oil and gas resources would be too low because we're obviously going to use coal and we're going to use unconventional oil, unconventional gas. Um, however, 100% recovery of all of this is going to be beyond plausibility, even as we discover more unconventional oil and gas and the substitutes for conventional oil, gas, and coal that we don't recover. So uh, because all conventional resources will not be recovered. So the meaningful range that I would say is uh, for policy baseline discourse and climate policy is in roughly this range of the RCP 6 to RCP 4.5 range. And this RCP 7 to 8.5, you really do need extreme coal to get there because that's what all of the scenarios generated by integrated assessment models do, even today. But as I said at the start of the talk, we're not just concerned about baselines. We're concerned about getting to lower scenarios, uh, RCP 3.4, 2.6, 1.9 for 2 degrees, 1.5 degrees. So what does this analysis say for those? Well. So I took the GCAM integrated assessment model, and I used that to explore this question of fitting its coal supply curve closer to what we've seen over the last few decades. And so the coal supply curve, it looks very similar to the one in message where uh, the cost for coal, it does not change very much. And this is a log scale, uh, just in case uh, you're looking at the details there, where the, uh, the GCAM model, it has about 1,600 years of coal production in it. And uh, what we're looking at in terms of primary energy costs is that coal, uh, until you get well above uh, reserves, it stays w relatively cheap, even at $2 a gigajoule to produce this whole curve. And so I just said, what if we shift that supply curve to something that's closer to what we've seen in coal markets and, and coal reserves, and then model policy costs based on that? So if you have the default coal supply curve in GCAM, you get climate policy costs to achieve 2.5 2 degrees, 1.5 degrees, it looks something like this. And then if you use simply the only change in the model is using this empirically constrained coal supply curve, you get significant reductions in the cumulative policy it costs to achieve very modest climate policy goals or more stringent climate policy goals of 2 or 1.5 degrees, uh, greater than 50% reduction to get to 2 degrees. 
What does that look like for carbon taxes? Well, the default uh, coal supply curve, if you compare that to the empirically constrained coal supply curve, you get roughly 30% reductions to 20% reductions for these climate policy goals. And so that brings the question, why do projected climate policies cost so much less if coal is more expensive and not unlimited in the model? And that's because projected climate policies, uh, uh, much of the cost is based on massive investments in innovation to keep pace with this cheap, limitless, high carbon backstop resource. So if the cheap, unlimited, high carbon backstop resource is more expensive, then the gap to bridge between lower carbon technologies, uh, even such as natural gas or renewables or electric vehicles, is uh, much smaller. So uh, the, if the hypothetical cheap, limitless, high carbon backstop resource is more expensive, the gap is smaller. So what if this is good news? What if achieving climate policy goals actually cost much less than the standard IPCC narrative? Uh, I'll just recap before I get into the summary slides what I've not said. I've not said we're running out of coal, that we won't use coal in the future, that coal production won't grow in the future, and that the amount of coal reserves will always stay the same, or that climate change is not a problem. But what I have said is that climate change uh, science and policy has been directly and indirectly using these boundless coal production outlooks based on a legacy concept from the 1970s energy policy that's flawed. And a coal backstop's the only plausible basis for high emission scenarios much greater than RCP6. And combusting recoverable coal, oil, and gas resources, uh, especially conventional, are consistent with approximately RCP6. We would need a significant uh, extraction of uh, seafloor methane, uh, for example, to go well above RCP6. And so this is the relevant range for policy baselines. So when we take the kind of classic uh, reasons for concern, uh, burning embers diagram from the IPCC diagram, and we look at sea level rise and relative sea level rise for the different scenarios, we can say, what does that look like for RCP6 based on all the model outputs? We can do that for a lot of different uh, impacts. But I think that when you reflect on where the thinking was back in 1990 when the first IPCC report was released, we wouldn't have imagined that headlines like this would be happening in places like India with fast growing economies and populations that are becoming richer and using more energy, that cheap renewable energy is killing the coal-based power plants, that India is canceling uh, coal power plant plans and uh, replacing that with plants for solar. The UK has a uh, rapid decline in coal that's driving carbon emissions down. China is putting in uh, coal-fired power capacity reduction targets and capping consumption in medium-run policy outlooks. That US coal power was at lowest level since the 1980s. Um, and that the EIA and the IEA are reflecting this in their medium-run policy scenarios where basically coal uh, consumption is roughly flat. And um, here's an example from the Global Coal Plant Tracker, and they do a very great, great job of tracking global coal plant retirements and additions. And we've been declining. We've been on a decline curve for quite some time, and we're actually reaching a breaking point where retirements around the world are breaking even with the amount of net additions in places like China and India. And so that leads the IEA to write that global coal investment has peaked and is now in a dramatic slowdown, and that China is building much of the current pipeline but has no need for new plants. So in order to summarize, I'll give you a few summary items and then some takeaways. So coal was imagined as the ultimate energy source of the future in business as usual climate science and policy scenarios, which became the baselines for policy assessments and impact modeling. And this perspective was rooted in the synthesis of climate and energy modeling that developed post-1970 energy crisis. Uh, in reality, coal has been far less innovative, cost-effective, and more limited than anticipated by these BAU scenarios. Oil, gas, renewables, and efficiency have all done far better. And much of the anticipated climate, climate policy costs in uh, large integrated assessment models comes from combating this unlimited and cost-free high carbon backstop energy resource. Therefore, we may not be as far off target from two degrees as we thought, and achieving that goal may not cost as much as we thought. And if we miss it, maybe the outcome will be closer to three degrees rather than much greater than four degrees, which is still not good. So in terms of policy takeaways and, and what I would say, having done this work, is that I think there's a, a lot of uh, argument that uh, we're pushing politicians to ratchet up ambition and promise even bigger and more ambitious climate goals. And then this creates antagonistic suites of policies that the next political po uh, party is excited to overturn. And actually, I think it's OK if we push for more modest goals that are actually effective 
and uh, more stringently enforced. So that would be one takeaway. And then uh, coal is the main technology that's adopted at the root of all scenarios that go way above two degrees. And so uh, phasing out coal for electricity generation where it's possible and curtailing research on coal-based sin fuels and underground coal gasification can actually make a big impact when we're thinking about long-run future. And then a third item that also a number of recent studies have uh, pointed out and would agree with is that much of the infrastructure that would take us well above two degrees isn't built yet. So there's still uh, an opportunity to avoid uh, two degrees and higher. So thank you very much for listening to the talk, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, it seems con consistent. We have with some of the things you quoted uh, are referenced to. Uh, Tad Patzek study on coal production, and I right. guess David Rutledge at Caltech has done a, a similar one, just looking at historical production and projecting what might happen, and they come to the conclusion that it's hard to imagine coal production being what is in the IPCC scenarios in a high range. So you seem to be agreeing with that. They're just looking at historical data and not as much as the future-looking aspects. So uh, <clears throat> that's that's... That's quite interesting. I don't know if I have a question there, but that was just an added comment. So, yeah, well, actually, yeah. I'll just I'll build yeah. on that. And so uh, a lot of the literature in this area is designed specifically to defeat that argument, that historical production, if you create some kind of cumulative uh, supply curve based on that and look at depletion rates, that will uh, not be able to achieve these high coal scenarios. And that's because the modelers are saying we're thinking about the future and the way that technology could evolve in order to achieve them, right? And so they're saying, well, we're specifically imagining a world where coal is cheap like that, and uh, it's cheaper than, say, oil and gas, and so that's why it substitutes in. But uh, on the flip side, I think now we've seen so much momentum in the energy system and more data points to actually empirically validate these coal supply curves, that's not the case. And so even if you do imagine relatively abundant coal, you have to go back and calibrate to the data to some extent. Right, that's that's my understanding as well. That when they go back and look at what's actually getting extracted and assessing seam sizes and seam thicknesses, they're thinking people are just avoiding uneconomic coal that they thought was there or accounted as a high number in the past, but it's just not practically getting extracted for reasons that it's in Siberia or a thin seam. So yeah, so I think I agree that assessments seem that we're not going to extract as much coal. Go ahead. No, great talk, Justin. Thank you. Um, I work in the energy policy arena, so maybe this question is more directed towards, you know, a policy person than than yourself. But um, you know, I see. I totally agree with you that yeah, the the RCP six, RCP four point five are more likely scenarios. Um, but yet, I still see a lot of people um, using RCP eight point five as a base business usual scenario. The latest national climate assessment just did the same. Just did that. Um, so how do we how do we get people to understand what you just talked about and just kind of come around to saying, okay, maybe we need to, you know, reassess things a little bit if we're going to make good policy decisions, you know, and start to look at 4.5 or 6 as a more reasonable scenario. For yeah, business. I think that's, that's a really good question. And part of the dialogue around the emphasis of RCP 8.5 and the National Climate Assessment was that when you look historically at the pathway we've been following, it matches closest to RCP 8.5. And so the issue with that is if you really understand these scenarios, they're not based on what's happening over the last 10 years. They're about different states that the global economy and technology choices that we could make in the future. And so uh, from my perspective, that's an invalid argument. And I actually think most of the scenario developers, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they would argue the same thing, that that's a misuse of those scenarios. So first off, it's helping people understand that. It's just because you can fit the last 10 years of data to the last 10 years of RCP 8.5 maybe, uh, which actually if you do that in terms of CO2 emissions, that's not the case at all. Uh, that's not a valid argument for using it. And then the other question is helping to take the kind of uh, abstract just pathways of greenhouse gases that are commonly used in the climate modeling community and helping climate modelers. I've done a number of different presentations to uh, Earth system science research groups, oceans research groups, and the biggest answer that I get is quite commonly that they use the RCP 8.5 scenario because it shows a very large effect. But then from my perspective, that's not justification for actually going in and using that scenario. So 
it, when I talk to them and I show them the assumptions that go into it, they typically agree, OK, I, I get it. We're not on track for RCP 8.5. It's actually an extreme scenario. But then when you submit a paper to review and it goes through the review process, it's hard to not use the RCP 8.5 scenario in those communities. So I think it's just uh, getting these kinds of arguments in front of, of more audiences and helping them to think more holistically about what the, the scenarios actually mean and the assumptions that go into them. I think that'll help. But then in the ener energy policy space, it's we can talk about it more directly and address it. But then there's a, a big issue, which is that when, uh, say, carbon budget analyses are done, they're based on, uh, say, like the uh, cumulative, the TCRE, the cumulative response to carbon. And a lot of these curves are calibrated in climate models based on an RCP 8.5 scenario that initially runs them. And so when you read the literature, it's kind of gray. It's a gray area of, well, if we used RCP 6 as the baseline, would it change that? And it kind of different authors argue different ways. But when it actually comes to the limited modeling time that these modelers have, they just they don't do that. So it's still uh, an open area as far as I understand. Yeah, I think I've heard an explanation for the high emission scenarios similar to perhaps what you just said that, well, when I run my climate model, I want to be able to see actually what's changing and to, to actually determine various things are changing. I need a lot of emissions. So can you give me one of those just so I can see if I can actually see large effects, independent of whether you think that they're actually going to happen or not. From a pure scientific modeling perspective, you're like, well, let me hammer it so I can see if it reacts more rather than just kind of throw a pebble on it and see if, which, uh, right. how much it reacts. It's hard to actually uh, tell what's going on in the yeah, model. Yeah, I do, I do understand that uh, to some extent, having uh, been in material science and working in a lab and, and seeing that kind of thing. I, I get that to some degree. But I would hope that uh, journal editors and reviewers, they help to take when modeling teams run the 8.5 and just say, you know, we'll put that in the SI section and not describe that as business as usual and make that the key thing in the abstract. Because even today, after having published papers on it a long time ago, and you know, Patsik and Dave Rutledge arguing against the coal outlooks years ago for the IPCC SRS scenarios that were in the third and fourth assessment, you know, they still get used. So I, I don't think it's necessarily going to change uh, quickly. Any other questions? That's, that's a challenge if people pick up on, I mean, they pick up on what's in the journal article. So if the journal articles only talk about 0.5, then all the discussions about 8.5. <laughs> um, your use of um, unconventional gas, does that include the methane hydrates? Yes, yes. So all of the, in that uh, bar, the column plot that I showed, the BGR, the German Natural Resource Ministry, they include that. That's in the total resource base of unconventional gas. For the case of uh, coal uh, production or coal consumption in the future, so if you see the population is heavily in India, China, and Indonesia, right? More than 50% or 60% in the future, 55% at least going to live there. And there we don't have so much of oil or natural gas. So they have to, even if you say now that, okay, the majority of the cost is going to come in uh, be because of investment, I think those investments will eventually happen to meet the demand. And then if more, now, okay, all these ships are built uh, on oil. They run by oil power. But if research happens and then you can have ships run on coal, then again, coal consumption will increase, right? So how are these predictions matching yeah, the so, reality? So I think you raise a good point where uh, substituting away from say, liquid fuels that are used in ships, uh, maybe coal-based sin fuels are used to a higher degree there. It's really, it's the scale at which coal-based sin fuels are used in these scenarios that are the issue, where a lot of these no-policy scenarios produced by integrated assessment models, I think I actually have a slide in here of the coal-based liquid uh, fuel outlooks, uh, production outlooks, but they're up above 200 million barrels a day of coal-based sin fuels. And when you back calculate the amount of water that would be required to run and actually produce that, it's just outside the bounds of plausibility. So uh, like I said in the slide of what I didn't say, I didn't say that we're not going to use coal and that coal's not going to grow. I just think it's the rate of coal and uh, the industries that it's used in by these energy economy models that are very miscalibrated. So uh, I do think that when you think about the, the substitution points, 
years ago, it was seemingly common knowledge that as India grew, it would build a tremendous amount of coal plants. And we've seen that to some degree. And so recently, we're seeing a lot of these solar auctions come in at a point where they're out-competing coal, and the thermal sector in India is under a lot of financial stress. So the question is, will that dynamic continue, or will it reverse at some point in the future? I'm not an expert in the area to know in 20 years, will that dynamic reverse, and then we'll start seeing a large-scale buildup of coal plants again. I think specifically for India's case, the coal sector is not picking up right now. That's because of like the railway transport. But once they set up those investments again, I think in future, coal is going to increase. So that's what I was saying. Maybe because the demand is high, it may be more. Right. So I, I agree that the investments, investment will be made in increasing energy demand in India. It's just, will it be made entirely in coal in the way it was imagined years ago? I really doubt that. I think that solar's proving to be more competitive. So even if there are more coal plants built, there's, they're still going to face stiff competition. Hey, Justin, this is Mason Edmund. I think we've talked before. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and uh, I was just wondering if you've tried to engage with people who are like intimately involved with IPCC about these things. Because like I was, when I was working as a journalist, I wrote about the development of the RCPs back when they were first doing that. And I talked to Naki at Yasa, and he said he thought the, R the highest RCP was never going to come to pass because actually the warming and so on would be so bad that things would just kind of start to fall apart and the systems wouldn't even keep running. And he said, you know, we have it in there to show what might happen, but I really don't think it's going to happen. So then it's weird that they describe it as business as usual. And when I tried to talk to people about these kind of coal estimates, like I talked to Jay Edmonds, who's you know one of these people who's been involved for decades yeah, with, with the this GCAM stuff. model. He's like, well, this is what the geologists told us, so he's just passing the buck instead of like saying, well, let's take a look at the estimate. So I'm curious, like, have you tried talking to any of these people yeah, about it? On, yeah, and thanks for coming let, out, Mason. It's good to me, see you. Let me ask. So you have called it BAU. Is is this is actually called BAU in the IPCC reports, or just clarify that maybe? Yeah, so the IPCC has improved of not explicitly labeling the RCP 8.5 as BAU, but they also don't label any of the scenarios as BAU. And then in the original RCP documents, it, the RCP 8.5 is the only one that's no policy. And then because of that, it means that a lot of the downstream work, like the economic study that I showed, they label it business as usual. And then it's just created this ongoing confusion. And part of that's because it looks like the business as usual going all the way back to the first IPCC assessment. So uh, a lot of people who work in this field, they see that scenario, and then they just carry forward the BAU labeling of it. But I do think that, in general, the RCPs are better than previous suites of scenarios because they span a wider range. And now there's the SSP scenarios, and I didn't want to get into all that terminology in a kind of public talk like this, because you get so many acronyms and everything, it just gets jargon field. But um, they're still using an RCP 8.5 scenario. It actually uses even more coal than the 2011 RCP 8.5 scenario that I showed. And so it's, it's, there's other reasons, as you alluded to, why there's an 8.5 scenario still there. But I think more people in that community, when I talk to them, they're upfront about how they feel it's unrealistic based on their best knowledge, but it still gets used and it still gets put into the suite of scenarios that are used. And then for the CMIP-6 experiments for the IPCC-6 assessment report, uh, despite what we are talking about in this room about how unlikely the 8.5 scenario is, they assigned groups of scenarios for different Earth system modelers to run and assigned RCP-8.5 the highest priority. And so that kind of thing uh, to me is frustrating because when you have such an unlikely scenario labeled as highest priority to run, it doesn't seem like it's an efficient use of these models that generate tremendous amounts of data and are unwieldy to run. And so a lot of modeling teams can only run a few scenarios. And just for reference, I didn't actually allude to it, but I added the slide of all the fifth assessment database, no policy scenarios in their cold liquids output, just so you could see how much coal to liquids was in them. <laughs>
I'm trying to figure out how to um, ask this question. I'm more on the energy side than the, the climate side. So, um, and I think you talked about it in some of your slides. Can you talk about if, if someone uses 8.5 versus 6.5 versus some of the others as their, um, uh, in their studies, how, do, how does, I mean, how does it change their results? How does it, um, how does it, uh, like, what are the cost differences? What are those costs, et cetera? Right. So do you mean more in the, on the impact side of the physical or system models or in more of the energy economic models? And yeah, so, so mitigation or adaptation, how does it? Yeah. So actually, hold on a second. Let me just go back to some of the climate impact side. So on, on the climate impact side, the IPCC assessments, the advantage of having these intercomparison projects where all the modelers use the similar scenarios, uh, you can just see if you are of the opinion that 4.5 or 6 are more likely than 8.5, you can just look at those results and then see what that means for global temperature, sea level rise. And so in an image like this that's in the summary for policymakers, you can see sea level rise from the 1990s and the 8.5 scenario mean of, so this is just summarizing all the models that ran the 8.5 scenario in the range and what that means in terms of, uh, of sea level rise. And actually, I have this little program on my computer if it'll pull up. Uh, well, anyways, y you can do that for 6 or 4.5 or whatever it might be. So the results are there uh, if, if you interpret them in that way and look at the different scenarios. And then the energy economic side uh, in assessing climate policies, um, so my example was from the GCAM model, which is widely used in energy studies and in decarbonization studies. And so uh, part of the policy cost of implementing a carbon tax in order to shift the economy toward two or one and a half degrees, it has to fight against the momentum of this high carbon, cheap backstop resource. And so when you change that in the model and then you tell it to solve for go to RCP 4.5 or go to RCP 3.4 for the two degrees, it comes out with lower costs. And you can see that in the abatement curves and, and all the outputs. So the question would be, in every integrated assessment model, would you get similar results from the looking at the way the cumulative resource curves are structured? I would argue that you would get similar result, results in most of the integrated assessment models that produce these scenarios. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Thank you very much, Justin, for that yeah, informative and chart-filled talk. Thank you. Thank you.